Thanks so much for coming. Um, my name is Linda Alderson, and for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about actions that we can take to help us safeguard our assets and, uh, and money. And I've been told that I, I'm supposed to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me. So let's get that over with quickly. Um, you know, we all wear many hats. Uh, the hat I wear all the time is that of a daughter. These other hats I wear from time to time. Um, advocating for seniors became more of an issue as I, um, when I came back from, from, uh, from living in Australia for a number of years. And I started working with lawyers who were preparing uh, clients for court, for litigation court, as siblings took siblings to court over the management of their parents' financial affairs. Elaine spoke about how that, um, that area of law is growing. And unfortunately, it is growing and growing and growing. And I just became aware that um, there was a real need for something to help people understand what the record keeping responsibilities were when looking after someone else's money. And also for people to understand what they should expect when they have uh, someone, when they hand over the day-to-day -day management of their money to, to someone else. And this led to the creation of a, of a book that I wrote with my, my brother, who is a Wilson estate lawyer. And I have some outside for sale, if you like. Um, and the book was designed to assist both groups. Firstly, it's a, it was aimed to assist people to, to protect their money and assets. <coughs> also to keep families out of litigation court, and thirdly, to help reduce the stress that comes with this daunting task. So uh, that's enough on, on me. Let's get into what we really came here to talk about. How many, of us, how many of us here think that we can count on family members to uh, help us safeguard our assets? I have a couple of stories that might change your mind. There was once a family of five, a mom, a dad, daughter, and two sons. The dad died first. The two sons removed themselves from the picture shortly after the death of their father, and, um, and the mother had a power of attorney document, which was good for property and personal care, in which the daughter was identified as the attorney. And this was initially a good thing because the mother's mental and physical health started to decline shortly after her husband's death. Unfortunately, the absence of her two sons from the picture and the isolation the mother found herself in made it very easy for the daughter to proceed to strip her mother of all her assets. She did this by using the power of attorney document to put all her mother's assets into her name. Two years after the father's death, the daughter decided that due to her mother's continuing mental and physical decline and the fact that she was a lot, away a lot traveling for pleasure using her mother's money, um, she should move her mother into a retirement home. And this she did. This is a story that clearly illustrates theft, misuse of funds, and perhaps the most disappointing thing it, it, it points to is the breach of trust between the attorney, the daughter, and the person that she was supposed to be looking out for, the mother. Another family incident involves a woman whose husband had passed away, leaving her with a small house fully paid for. Fantastic. Until the professional daughter comes along with the professional husband and two small children, bullied her mother into sharing the house and providing free daycare for the young children. Eventually, the daughter convinced the mother that it was a good thing to put the house in both their names. The time came when the mother was tired of being full-time babysitter, wanted to sell the house and use the proceeds for her retirement. But the daughter refused to agree to sell. Without the daughter's consent, the house could not be sold. Unfortunately, we are not safe in the hands of our family. What about professionals that we deal with? How many of us think we can count on our professional advisors? Once upon a time, there was a man 
who thought he was more clever than everyone else. He thought that it would be easy to set himself up as an investment advisor, get people to trust him, and take their money. So this is what he did. And he was very successful at it for a number of years. And I'm not sure how he finally got caught, but fortunately he did. Some of you might recall a story hitting the headlines late 2009, early 2010 of an individual who had created a Ponzi scheme which resulted in over 100, 150 people losing around $50 million. So an example of how we can't really always trust our investment advisors or professionals that we use. So if we can't depend on our family and outside people, who can we really count on? Well, the answer, of course, whoops, is you, right? We all have to depend on ourselves. And so for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about actions that we can take that uh, will help us, uh, help us safeguard our money and our assets. We're going to talk about how to be prepared and how to be organized, guarding our personal information, Limit, limiting our debt, spending cautiously, having good annual habits, and lastly, keeping ourselves involved in the community in which we live. I won't go into too much detail about the wills and power of attorneys. Elaine's given us a really good presentation, but that's all about being prepared, and we really can't stress how important it is to have those documents in place and they're up to date. When you're putting your power, of, your power of attorney together, you might also think of having a, a clause in the document that requires a review of your finances every 12 to 18 months. So if your attorney has to step in and stop, start acting on your behalf, if they know that they're going to have to sit down with you and a third party, whether it's your lawyer or another, another one of your children, that might just uh, keep them a little bit more honest may make them be a little bit more proficient with their record keeping, that it's, it's up to date. Um, have a retirement plan, plan in place. Uh, again, Elaine spoke to this. You know, you're going to want to think about when you want to downsize. Is it when you're 50? Is it when you're 60? Is it when you're 80? And where are you going to downsize downsize to? Is it, are you going to move from your four bedroom family home to a two bedroom condo, a townhouse? Are you going to go into independent living community, a continuing care community, what it is you're going to move to? You want to think about these things before the day comes when you actually have to move because you want to cost these things out so that you know how much money you might need and that will, that will help you later on as you spend cautiously. How many times are you going to move? You might just decide, I'm just moving once right into the retirement community and you may only be 65 and that's fine. You, you've done it, you've downsized, it's all, all the thoughts taken, taken away, it's great. And perhaps you know, the most important element of that is how are you going to fund your retirement? Being prepared, too, is about having your professionals lined up. Have your lawyer. Make sure that power of attorney and will is up to date, that you review it every couple of years, every five years, to make sure nothing's changed in your life. You may only use a lawyer twice in your life. Once for real estate and the second time for your power of attorney and, and wills. If that's all you use them for, fine. But you want to use them, you want to use the specialists for those kind of transactions. Make sure it's done right. If you're not sure whether you can trust them, you can get hold of the Law Society and ask whether there's any uh, complaints against them to give you some protection that you're dealing with, with a, good, a good lawyer. 
Same with accountants. You want to have your accountant in place. You might think, well, my tax return is really easy. I just do it, and it's so easy with the software these days. You're quite right. But as we get older and our expenses change, our health changes, and suddenly we have a lot more medical expenses, a good accountant can advise you and lead you to make sure that you're getting all the tax receipts you need, they're in the proper format, and that you're making all the claims. And again, if you're not sure whether they're on the up and up and you want to check them out, the, Ontario, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accounts of Ontario is, is your, a good place to check them out. Again, your investment advisor. You may think, I don't need an investment advisor. I don't have that much I'm investing. They're in a few, a few stocks. I like them. My RSP is already taken care of. However, an investment advisor is a really good source of information on different insurance products. So while you may not deal with an investment advisor on a regular basis, it might not be a bad idea to touch base with them every few years just to see what products are out there, long-term care insurance, health plans, those kinds of things that, you, that might be a good idea for you. So being prepared is one of the best ways to ensure that we protect our dignity as we grow older, our independence, we remain participating in decisions that concern us, that there's fairness between you and your caregiver, and of course protecting our security and safety, both physical and financial. I think some people are born with an organization gene. Some people find it really easy to be organized. Other of us find it a little bit more challenging. However, when it comes to our important papers, we all need to take that little bit more care, a little bit more effort to be organized. We want to have a filing system for all our important papers. So it doesn't have to be complicated or complex, a banker's box, some envelopes, a filing cabinet, but you want to put all your bank and investment statements in there, your contracts, any insurance policies you have, debt information. You want to make sure that every month you're organized so that you review your bank statements as they come in, your credit card statements. You only have 30 days after the end of the statement date in which to contact your financial institutions and let them know that you don't agree with something that's gone through. So it's important that you stay on top of those, those statements. Joint accounts, I, won't, I don't have to say too much about them. Uh, Elaine spoke uh, very well about those. Use, you know, basically, they're not really a good idea. They're, you know, so use them sparingly. There are situations where it, they, they can be useful. They are a good idea. And, and if you do use joint accounts, you really want to be clear on your intent and have a written document that you file with your will that says, you know, my intent is that on my death, whatever's left in this bank account, I want to go to that person that, that is on the account with me. Or not. And just leave no questions. Don't leave it up to the, the interpretation of the law to, uh, to make your final wishes a reality. Think about downsizing the number of financial institutions you deal with. You know, the less financial institutions, the fewer bank accounts you have, the fewer credit cards you have out there is a great protection for you because it means there's less for you to keep track of. There's less opportunity for cards to go amiss and get misused. So it's um, being organized is one of the best ways that we can ensure that the continuity in the running of our affairs should we need to enact our power of attorney. So if you have a stroke or you're in an accident and your attorney has to step in right away, they can just go to that banker's box, there's all your important papers, your bank statements, they know right away which bank they're supposed to be dealing with, they can go to the bank, get their signature uh, recognized and whatnot, and whatever finances you need in order to ensure that you have the care that you deserve, uh, it is going to be there very quickly. It's also a good way to ensure that unauthorized or unusual transactions are spotted on a timely manner 
and, uh, and investigated. Unfortunately, identity theft is on the rise. And so we cannot be too careful when it comes to protecting our personal information. You want to make sure that you shred any paper with financial or personal information before disposing. Now, I don't necessarily shred the whole piece of paper, but I will rip out the address part or the address and account number and rip that up in tiny little pieces. And then I don't really care what the rest of the, the, the letter or whatever says. Passwords and passcodes, we want to limit the sharing of those and we want to be careful where we write them down. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we have so many passwords going on in our head and we can't keep them straight because of course you're told not to have the same password for every account. So you think, yeah, but I have to write them down. I have to give them to somebody. So okay. Well, you don't necessarily have to give them to somebody. Writing them down and putting them in your file of important papers with your will is, is a good place to, to store them. And then you have easy access to them. Or should your attorney need to start acting for you, certainly your executor, when you die, then can just will find those passwords on upon your death when they go for your will and they'll be able to do everything they need to do at that time don't disclose your personal details on the phone unless you've initiated the call that you phone the company cuz you wanted to settle a debt and, and you know exactly who you're talking to don't leave personal information laying out uh, in the open at home or in your car uh, in the office, particularly at home if you have caregivers coming in, if you have a, a cleaning lady coming in or wheels, wheels, meals on wheels. You know, it's important for us not to tempt people. It's not fair for us to put the carrot in front of them and not expect, well, we might not expect them to, to eat the carrot. It's still, it's not, it's not something we should be doing. When going on holidays, arrange stop on, a mail, on your mail or ask a friend to come by and pick it up regularly. Only transmit your personal information on websites that have that HTTPS. You want to make sure that they're secure and when they have that S at the end, you, uh, that's, that's them telling you that their system is governed by secure software. So guarding our personal information is a great way to reduce the risk of identity theft. And it also decreases the opportunities for those around you to inappropriately borrow funds. Okay, I'm thinking of a situation where you, know, you, you lent your bank card to your nephew or you, you gave your bank card to your nephew to go to the bank for you. And so you gave him your your passcode. And he went and got you the $200, he brought it back, and he gave you your card back, and everything's fine. And then a month later, you've left it out on your dresser, and he's over visiting. And he's thinking, oh, you know, I could really use it for the next $100, because of whatever. You know, Grandma isn't going to miss it, and I'll, I will pay it back. I'm just going to borrow her bank card. I'm not going to tell her, you know, because I know she'll be okay with it. He goes off with your bank card, takes out his hundred dollars, brings his bank card back. You're no, you know, you're no wiser. Okay, so you don't want to leave that kind of temptation out out for people. When we're young, debt is a good thing. Debt, a certain amount of debt, is a good thing because it helps us create a, a credit history for ourselves, which which is good. As we grow older we want to limit our debt. And particularly when we retire, we hope to be debt free because then of course we don't have the monthly income or the, the every two weeks income coming in to help us fund that, the, the repayment of that debt. So scenario A is the optimal solution where we have no debt. We pay off our credit cards every month. Scenario B, uh, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Cash inflows are always greater than your cash outflows. Scenario B is our not optimal situation, but sometimes it's simply not, uh, not avoidable. 
So if you're in that kind of situation, whatever age you are, it's really important that we have a, play, a payback plan in place and that we stick to it. So, you know, sometimes choices have to be made and, you, you know, you really want to spend money here, but you know you have to make that $100 payment into the, into the loan to get that down. You really need to prioritize that. You need to kind of think of the interest that you're not paying that on that loan because you're decreasing it and getting rid of it is actually income for yourself that you have retained in your bank account that you can spend on yourself now or put it into savings. Consider very carefully loans to friends and family. I know that as, as we grow older and we've worked at this nest egg and we're very proud of our savings and because we have these huge hearts and we want to share or help our nephew, our niece, our children out, we're, oh yeah, I, I can afford to give them $5,000 or I can lend them $10,000. If you're going to do that, make sure that you evidence in writing what the payback terms are if there's any interest that you're expecting and any forgiveness. You might decide that you're happy to lend your niece $5,000 and have her pay you back $100 a month interest-free. But if you should die before the loan is paid back, you're happy to forgive it. So if she still owes you $2,000 at the day you die, you need to say on a piece of paper that's signed by both of you, stick it with your will, that you're forgiving this debt because your, your executor needs to know that so that they, first of all, that they're aware of this, this money that's out there, but that they don't have to hound the niece for payment of it. Limiting the, limiting the amount of debt we have is one of the best ways we have to ensure that our money continues to work for ourselves that we have the retirement that we planned. And it also provides a safety net should there come a day when we have an emergency and we need, we need funds. And I'm kind of looking at that in two ways. Firstly, if we're very well off uh, and we have that nest egg and we haven't been lending it out to friends and family, then should we have an emergency we need uh, some surgery that can't be paid for or our health costs just go up and not not being covered by government funding then we have the money there for us and there's no panic we can we still retain our peace of mind uh, if we're not quite so well off and really we shouldn't um, and so we don't have that like nice little nest egg should we have an emergency that arises or just an extra big expense that we like to incur, like a trip over to the homeland one last time, and we're going to need a bank loan to do that, we're more likely to get that bank loan if we don't already have a lot of debt encumbering us. Okay? Oh, spend cautiously. That's, some, that's something easier for some of us than others. Um, but you want to be careful about contracts you sign. Particularly as we get older, we want to look at the duration and we want to look at any cancellation fees because they can be uh, a real kicker. I worked for a gentleman for a number of years when I first came back from Australia and he always, always leased his cars. He was an elderly gentleman even when I started working with him. He leased his cars. Unfortunately, he passed away shortly after taking out a, out a new lease. And the leasing company and the car dealership were not particularly um, sympathetic to his family when the family went to resolve the outstanding lease. So, you know, despite the fact that this gentleman had been dealing with them for years, so we really want to make sure, as, as we get older, that we look at the duration of those contracts. And, and while a five-year contract in the long run might look to be cheaper than the three-year contract, depending on your age and your health issues, uh, on your family history, a three-year lease actually might turn out to be cheaper for your estate. 
just something for us to think about. Never sign anything at the door. I know sometimes you get, you know, these people trying to sell you a new roof or a new fence and, and the deal just seems too good to pass up. But we need to remember that if the deal is really that good, if the company is, um, is a good company to deal with, is fair with their customers, then they're going to give you time to have someone else read the contract. So that's what you want to say to them. This, is, this sounds good. I'll take the contract and I'll call you in a couple of days. They'll also allow you time to do your homework. And this is what we want to do, particularly with our larger purchases. We want to look at, uh, at the newspaper. We want to talk to friends and see what the competition is charging and, and doing and saying about the, the product. Don't accept telephone solicitations. This is a, a really big area of scamming, particularly for uh, younger people against older people. Unfortunately, many of us who stay in our own homes as we age become uh, isolated and that makes us lonely. So when we get somebody on the phone who actually wants to talk to us, we're really happy to have a great conversation with them. And these people will start talking to you and like three minutes later, you're thinking, this is my long lost nephew. And we really want to be careful of those kind of people. If you talk to somebody long enough to think that, yes, that product or that organization is somebody, something I think I would like to financially support, ask them to send you a brochure in the mail. Okay, if they're a legit organization, they'll have something they can mail to you. And then you can take a look at it, maybe look on the web to see what they're doing, and then send them a, a check. Watch out for these kind of expressions, you know, today only, too good to pass up. You know, these are expressions used to entice you, to pressure you into making a quick decision. And really, if it's that good a deal, it will be there tomorrow. We need to remember that. Spending cautiously will help prevent you from running through your money too quickly. Uh, you know, particularly since we're all, we're all living so much longer. And, you know, despite family history and what you might think, we are just living so much longer. We're, we're taking small steps to have a healthier lifestyle. And so, you know, 10 years ago when you initially did your retirement plan and you thought, okay, this is how much money I'm going to have and, yeah, this will be fine because, you know, I'm probably only going to live to be 80 because you know, this and this and this and this. Well, you know, you might surprise yourself at how long you end up living. So you want to make sure that your money lasts as long as you do. And spending cautiously will, will help that happen. It also helps set up a pattern that your attorney can follow. So should you have to rely on that power of attorney document, should you have a stroke, become incapacitated, and they need to step in for you. If they can take a look at your last six months of spending and get an idea of the kind of things you like to spend your money on, and the, you know, that, you know, knowing what you did spend your money on will also tell them what you didn't spend your money on. And that's good information for them to have because that, and that gives you peace of mind that they're going to continue to spend your money on you on the same things. Practicing good annual habits. Okay, everybody's eyes glaze over when I start talking budgets. But you know, it's one of the best things we can do to provide ourselves with peace of mind and to, uh, to make sure that our spending doesn't get out of hand is sitting down and looking once a year at our income coming in, looking at our known expenses, that we're, that we're thinking about for next year. And a lot of that is based on last year. But this year coming, you might be thinking, I'm going to be doing a trip, or I'm gonna have that elective surgery, or I, my first grandchild is being born, so I know I'm gonna have some extra expenses there. And then you wanna sit down with somebody that you trust and go over this with, with them. And it might be a couple of people, but you wanna incest your inflows, assess, Assess the inflows against the outflows and determine any changes to your investment portfolio. 
due to known cash needs. If you've got cash tied up in GICs and they're, they're laddered, but they're coming due at different times, and, uh, but you know, you've got $20,000 coming due the month before a big wedding or your trip overseas, maybe you don't want to roll over that whole 20000 you only want to roll over 10000 You want to make sure that 10000 is just in your cash account readily available. So you want to have some foresight. You want to be thinking about these things beforehand. And this offers great protection uh, should, your, should, your change, should your spending patterns change. Because if you've been talking to your daughter and you've gone through this program with them, and then suddenly, instead of taking $600 of cash out of the bank a month for your this, that, and the other thing, you're taking $1,000 out, and you are suddenly seem to be going out to dinner quite more frequently. Uh, you know, your daughter might say, hey, mom, like, you know, what's up? Or your daughter, because she's involved in your life all the time, actually notices that there's this new, younger person in your life. Well, what's up with that? Unfortunately, younger people are on the lookout for older people with nice golden nest eggs. And they worm their way into your confidence and suddenly you're, you know, buying them clothes, taking them out to the nicest restaurants, you know, paying for a weekend away, this kind of thing. So if you've already thought about what your next 12 months of spending is going to be and you've sat down and talked about it with somebody who's involved in your life, if that changes, perhaps they can step in and say, well, wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? Is this, really, is this really what you want? And of course, at the end of the day, if it is really what you want, then it is. But, you know, maybe you're feeling a little bit intimidated by this new person and you don't know how to get rid of them and so that uh, your daughter can, can help you do so. File your tax return every year. This, uh, this applies to everybody. If you're in a low income bracket, then you want to make sure you file it so that you get your government assistance, the GST rebate, any subsidies that you're entitled to, the Ontario homeowners, uh, tax credit, those, those kind of things. If if you think, well, you know, I pay installments and, you know, uh, my income, I'm fortunate enough that my income is high enough that I don't have these subsidies, uh, I, I'm not going to get them. You still want to file every year so that when you die, your, uh, your executor only has one tax return to file, that being your final tax return. And when they file it, they can then file the request for a clearance certificate which Elaine spoke about in her presentation. And so that, you know, that clearance certificate can take anywhere from three to six months to get. So when it does come, you want it to be the letter saying, yeah, this, the deceased person doesn't owe any more taxes, everything's good. Instead of the letter that says, no clearance certificate can be issued at this time because tax returns are outstanding for 2009, 10, and 11. That does happen. If, uh, and so the executor will have to get those tax returns up to date and ensure that any taxes outstanding are paid. If they've already distributed the estate, thinking, well, I'm, I'm sure mom had her tax returns up to date, and, uh, and so there's actually no money left in the estate bank account, then the executor is on the hook to pay those taxes. So, you know, do your executor a favor and make sure that your tax returns are all up all up to date. Annual reviews offer the three, three main protections. First of all, it ensures that spending doesn't get out of hand. It provides peace of mind for the year ahead. You know, it's nice, it's nice to know in the back of your mind that, you know, I'm taken care of, you know, because of, of my planning, I don't have to worry about anything, or I have fewer things to worry about. And if that emergency does arise, you're thinking, okay, I only have to deal with figuring out how I'm going to cope with this one financial emergency. You're not also thinking, yeah, but I've got you know, this and this and this and this, because you've already, you've already thought about your monthly expenses and you know that they're taken care of with your cash flow. It also is a good way to alert loved ones that you're still in the game. 
You know, if you're thinking ahead for a year and you're planning, then, you know, your daughter, your sons, nieces, now, okay, well, you know, Granny, you know, she's, she's still with us. Like, there's no slowing her down. And uh, she's still sharp as tacks, and we're not going to be able to pull the wool over her eyes. So, and that's, that's where we want to be. The last thing we want to talk about is keeping ourselves involved. If you, if you move to a retirement home or a, uh, a senior residence, a retirement living arrangement, you want to make sure that you join in those community events. Uh, those homes have something between 9 o'clock in the morning and 8 o'clock at night. There's just no, no shortage of activities for you to get involved in and meet the other residences. And, I, you know, even though I'm not there yet, uh, my mother is, and I can really appreciate that when you get that age, your tendency might be to kind of relax and stay in your own room. You have your little hobbies that you like to do, your crosswords, the music you like to listen to, your knitting, and you think, you know, do I really want to get out and meet more people when they're just going to die on me? And, I, you know, that's... There is something, you know, you've gone all... It takes energy to meet people and to share your story. But I think it's so important that we continue to share our stories right up until the day we die. Because that's something that we always have to offer. It doesn't matter that we can no longer be the accountant doing tax returns that we used to do, or the lawyer practicing law, or the nurse offering those care services in the hospital. We always have our life story to share. And, and that's the, that's, we can't put a value on that. And it's important that we keep sharing that until the day we die. Use the telephone. We're so fortunate here in Canada that we don't get charged time-wise for our local calls. There are countries that actually charge for local, local, they time you as soon as you pick up the phone. So take advantage of that fact. And long distance calling, there's so many great plans out there. So costs shouldn't be an issue keeping you off the phone. Join a club. The Optimist Club, I mean, there's so many. I just list two, but, you know, for every, there's knitting clubs, crochet clubs, woodworking clubs, uh, everything out there. Your local library has things. The local senior center has, has clubs that you can join. Begin a hobby that gets you connected. And you might be thinking, uh, you know, I have to get there, though, and I don't like driving at night anymore. Well, I, I'm sure any of a number of the other people that are in that club would be quite happy to come and pick you up and make sure that you get there. Volunteer. What a great way to meet like-minded people. And don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, sometimes our pride gets in the way, or, um, you know, we're taking that need to be independent just a little bit too, too far. Uh, something I used to always say to my father, you know, he was very difficult in terms of asking for help from his children. And I used to always say, well, Dad, you know, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that if we help you with this, it gives you more energy to do other things that you prefer doing. And so that's something I think we need to keep in mind as we grow older, that it isn't so much an issue of, of, of oh, I can't do that anymore, I'm too frail, or, you know, I, I can't. It's, it's the issue of we all only have so much energy. And right now, I'd rather spend my energy over here, not over here. So I'm going to ask for help with that. When we keep ourselves involved, it ensures that we're part of a larger community. And this can provide access to better support should we need it at some point, whether it's just information or whether it's physical help. And it also provides us with the nest of people who love and care for us and are watching out for us. And I, I can't, and this is very important for me because I don't have any children. And, you know, I'm, we're looking after my parents and, and, I'm, and we're all thinking, well, who's going to do this for me? Who's going to do this for us? And so I think it's so, you know, our community becomes so much more important. And 
in our society where you know technology is wonderful it's a great way to keep ourselves connected like all those people that are joining us today on the webcam but it also it, it makes us isolated and so we need to be sure that we keep having face-to-face -face contact with people and asking them about their stories and sharing our stories with them and because as we grow old older they are going to be the people that we're going to rely on to help us. So I hope I haven't talked too fast <laughs> and uh, given you some things to think about. A lot of these things are very practical. They're common sense in some ways. Some take a little bit more time to get into place, but they're, they're all achievable. And I think they're all things that we need to be thinking about to ensure that we protect our hard-earned money and our assets from being usurped by those, those around us. So we want to make sure that we're prepared and that we're organized, that we're taking precautions to guard our personal information, that we limit our debt, that we spend cautiously, that we have good annual habits in place, and perhaps most importantly, that we keep ourselves involved. We keep our connections with, with humanity, with those around us.